Welcome to today's Brookings event on the crisis in Ethiopia and its regional repercussions. I am Dr. Wonderful Bob Brown, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution and Director of the Initiative on Non-State Armed Actors and Co-Director of the Brookings Africa Security Initiative. The Initiative on Non-State Armed Actors seeks to advance policy relevant knowledge of non-state armed actors and illicit economies in the United States and around the world. The Brookings Africa Security Initiative especially focuses on the variety of threats, security challenges, as well as peace dynamics on the African continent. As with all of Brookings work, the predominant focus is on independent, objective, in-depth research that informs policy options and develops policy recommendations. The unfolding crisis in Ethiopia is of critical gravity. The military confrontation between the government of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and the Tigray political leadership has brought the country to the brink of another civil war. The latest battlefield picture is of a siege of the Tigray capital, Mekele, by Ethiopian federal forces, with the federal government giving an ultimatum to the Tigray leadership uh, to hand itself over to Addis Abeba. That ultimatum um, expires tomorrow. But even a military victory of the federal government may fail to quiet not just the Tigray Addis tension, but also the broader ethnic strife and center periphery tensions in the rest of the country. Already, the military confrontation has produced a grave humanitarian situation. The hostilities also pull in the wider region of Horn of Africa, including Eritrea, countries such as United Arab Emirates, and have large repercussions for what's happening in Somalia. I am joined today by an absolutely terrific panel that I will introduce in a moment for us to discuss these issues and a way forward. But before I do, I want to emphasize that when we were organizing the event, we made an extensive effort to bring in Ethiopian voices. We reached out to a good number of Ethiopian scholars and analysts, but they all declined for a variety of reasons to join the panel, including sensitivities about speaking publicly on those issues. We also sought other African perspectives and were thrilled when Mr. Murithi Mutiga project director for Horn of Africa at the International Crisis Group agreed to participate. Unfortunately, at the very last minute, he had to cancel. But we look very much forward to working with him and collaborating with him on events in the future, as well as to uh, engaging with Ethiopian scholars. At least we will have Ethiopian voices uh, in the question period. Many um, folks from Ethiopia have already submitted questions uh, through uh, the written functions and I will take those questions when we move to that section of the panel. I am now delighted to introduce my colleague, Ambassador Jeff Felton, who is the John C. Whitehead Visiting Fellow in International Diplomacy in Foreign Policy at Brookings. Jeff was the Under Secretary General for Political Affairs at the United Nations in New York prior to uh, coming to Brookings. And prior to that, uh, Jeff had a very distinguished career also in US diplomacy. Uh, he served as the Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs and U.S. Uh, Ambassador to Lebanon. He retired from the State Department with the um, distinguished rank of career minister. Mr. Peyton Knopf uh, is uh, another very talented U.S. diplomat, currently a senior advisor at the uh, U.S. Institute for Peace, where he focuses on the Red Sea region. At the same time, he is also advisor to the European Institute of Peace. Uh, Peyton uh, has held a variety of US diplomatic relations in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as uh, at the United Nations, where he served as coordinator of the UN panel of experts on South Sudan from 2015 to 2017. He was also the spokesman of the US mission to the United Nations under then ambassador Susan Rice and held a variety of other um, uh, diplomatic postings and diplomatic roles in the US Foreign Service. And I'm also thrilled to introduce uh, another colleague of mine, Zach Vertin, who is a non-resident fellow at Brookings. And prior to uh, that, Zach was a visiting fellow at the Brookings Doha Center. Uh, he too has a uh, uh, very accomplished, uh, uh, he too has served in a very accomplished way in US foreign um, uh, policy, 
Uh, he was the Obama administration's uh, director of policy for the US Special Envoy for Sudan and South Sudan between 2013 and 2016. And he wrote a terrific book uh, from those experiences called A Rope from the Sky, the making and unmaking of the world's newest state about South Sudan. Uh, Zach also spent six years at the International Crisis Group in the Africa program and um, uh, was an advisor on peace operations and multilateral affairs in the United uh, Security Council, United Nations Security Council. Zach, let me start with you. Uh, please explain to us what is the latest situation on the ground? Uh, what is the gravity of uh, the ultimatum? And importantly also, how did this crisis emerge? What are its sources? Thanks, Vanda. Uh, glad to be with you and hello to everyone uh, joining us from home. Um, I, I will focus uh, primarily on the last part of your question on the sources. Um, with a country of 110 million people, uh, it's often been said that Ethiopia is too big to fail, uh, and I certainly share that opinion. Um, not only could this conflict spread to other parts of Ethiopia, but it, it endangers uh, both the Horn of Africa as a whole, but also uh, the wider Red Sea region. So I'm going to paint with a very broad brush to sort of set the table for us here uh, as to where we are today. Uh, this conflict, uh, in my opinion, is about power. Uh, it's about economics. Uh, and it's about competing visions for the Ethiopian state. Um, it's about balancing stability and democratization, ethnic loyalties and national identity. Uh, and it's about a tension between uh, the old status quo and a desire for change. Um, when Prime Minister Abiy uh, came to power in 2018, um, I noted at the time that he had finally uh, taken the lid off of Ethiopia. Uh, and I think that lid needed to come off uh, because uh, the old system could no longer contain popular demands for change. So uh, removing that lid meant initiating one of the mo world's most important political transitions, uh, but it's also, also its most fragile. And I think what we're watching now is that project come uh, dangerously close to disaster uh, and the potential consequences of a wider war or of chaos in Ethiopia uh, really should not be underestimated. Um, they already, in my opinion, constitute a threat, uh, not only to the Ethiopian people, but a threat to international peace and security. So uh, the last two weeks of this conflict, uh, we've seen no shortage of finger pointing uh, about who is to blame, uh, finger pointing both among Ethiopians uh, and for that matter, uh, among those outside Ethiopia. Uh, but the reality is that both sides bear responsibility for the current state of affairs. Um, over the last two years, uh, both the TPLF and the prime minister have, have put each other in a corner. Um, so this conflict is about the TPLF's 27 year reign. Uh, it's about its uh, often stubborn reluctance to let go uh, of the power and economic influence which it so long enjoyed. Um, there remains a lot of anger towards the TPLF among Ethiopians of many backgrounds uh, for the way they govern the state, from stifling free speech to cracking down on dissent, uh, locking up opponents, etc. And we've seen a lot of that anger manifest uh, somewhat dangerously in recent weeks. Um, but the conflict is also about Prime Minister Abiy's desire to turn the page on them, the TPLF, and about the ways in which he has done that. Uh, now, for his advocates, uh, you know, his reign has meant upending the highly controlled state uh, in Ethiopia. It's meant promising sweeping reforms, including greater freedoms and economic liberalization. Uh, but for his detractors, uh, it, it's meant Abiy advancing of a vision uh, of the state with far too little consultation among Ethiopia's broad and diverse society, and doing so, uh, in their view, in excess of the transitional mandate that he, they believe he was entitled to. And most recently, it means uh, for them, Abiy's government mimicking the kind of repression, the kind of tactics that he had promised to usher out. So I just want to emphasize that uh, this is not just about Tigray versus the central government in Addis Ababa. Yes, that's the most intense right now. It's the most violent manifestation of it. But it's essential to understand that this is also very much about Ethiopia's nine other federal regions and their attempt to renegotiate their place in Ethiopia in this, the post-EPRDF era. So this conflict is about a system of ethnic federalism versus visions of a unitary state. It's about revolutionary democracy versus liberal democracy. And it's about division of the national cake. Uh, and, and again, it's against that backdrop that the war is now unfolding in Tigray. And it's a war that, in my estimation, no one can win. Uh, 
I think there will only be losers. Uh, and unfortunately, coming to that realization on the battlefield will mean, as we've seen in recent weeks, extraordinary human cost in terms of casualties, uh, of destruction, refugee flows, et cetera. So I would argue, uh, as is so often the case, that there is no military solution to this crisis. Uh, the only way out is a negotiated settlement uh, with both sides inevitably making some painful concessions. And, and while it's hard to envision that uh, in, a, in the highly polarized context uh, we're in, I do think it's possible. Uh, and to that end, last week for Brookings, I outlined a, a sort of three-point plan uh, the kind of foundational elements of a settlement, a baseline on which uh, Ethiopians themselves and, and hopefully uh, mediators uh, can build and revise as necessary. And I'll come back to those uh, later in our chat, but I just want to put them on the table here briefly. One is a cessation of hostilities. Uh, first, obviously, the fighting must stop and humanitarian access be allowed. And ideally, this should happen uh, before any push on final, quote unquote, final push on Mekele, the, the regional capital of Tigray. Uh, second is going to have to be some kind of mutual recognition of legitimacy. Uh, both sides have called each other illegitimate. Uh, to move the process forward, uh, each side is going to have to recognize each other's legitimacy until new elections are organized. And I think a range of normalizing measures uh, can flow from that, from restoration of funds to Tigray, federal funds to Tigray, uh, to accountability. Uh, this can and should include fair trials and, and imprisonment and, and uh, due process for those uh, on both sides who have employed violence or committed crimes, uh, you know, or, or sought to subvert the state. Uh, and third is, is a political dialogue, uh, really bringing all Ethiopians together, not only uh, the federal government and Tigray, uh, but uh, Ethiopia's broad society from all 10 regions uh, to set the terms and timing for new elections uh, and a constitutional process to follow. So I'll stop there. And I'll, as I mentioned, I'll come back to this uh, and put a, a bit more meat on the bone later. Uh, when we talk policy options. Thanks. Thanks very much for uh, uh, putting a, a lot of very rich dimensions on the table in a very pithy uh, way. You know, you spoke about uh, no one uh, will be a victor in the military confrontation, and certainly already the humanitarian situation is grave. There are perhaps 40,000 um, refugees in Sudan, many more internally displaced, and even prior to the crisis, Ethiopia was already suffering from some 2 million uh, people displaced across the country, uh, including uh, in Oromia. Uh, and you're, you're urging, of course, that, uh, that uh, the military confrontation can only bring bad things for the entire country and the region is again taking uh, place on the context of uh, the threat by the Ethiopian forces to uh, pounce on Mekele. We have some very recent horrific um, examples of how urban battles go, uh, most uh, dramatically Mosul, of course, uh, but Grozny is another example. None of us want to see uh, any of that suffering. Uh, Peyton, if I can um, go uh, now over to you. Um, Zach used the term uh, taking of the lid of Ethiopia. You, I, and Zag were on a same, uh, similar panel on Broader Horn of Africa at the very end of September. And uh, you were speaking about Ethiopia, the explosiveness of the situation there, its various dimensions. And the, the notion came up that um, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia might be like Yugoslavia was before the explosion, the Yugoslavia analogy. With what has happened uh, to a month and a half later, are we further or closer away to the uh, Yugoslavia analogy? Is that at all useful to think that way? Um, and um, what, uh, in addition to uh, uh, giving us your take on what's happening in the Tigray confrontation, can you also uh, speak more broadly about the center periphery issues, ethnic issues in other parts of the country, Amara, Oromo? Right now, they seem to be united in the effort uh, to smash the Tigray leadership. Will that unusual alliance last? What are the other implications? What are the internal political dynamics uh, in Tigray, but beyond Tigray? Sure, thank you very much, uh, Vanda, and thanks for, for Brookings for having me this morning. Um, you're, you're right, I think, to, to, to take us back briefly to, to the discussion that we had at the end of September. Um, and, and I do think there are some eerie similarities to Yugoslavia, in fact. Um, but I think there is one key difference that maybe is worth highlighting that we discussed uh, then, and, and to your question, I think it remains very relevant now, which is that 
uh, Yugoslavia imploded and uh, Ethiopia, and I think we're seeing that to some extent, is going to be uh, explosive the longer this national uh, political and security crisis unfolds. And I use the word national uh, very intentionally because I think it's important to situate what's happening uh, between the central government and Tigray in, as, as I think Zach was getting at as well, the broader uh, national context because it's symptomatic of a larger crisis uh, and debate over uh, or legitimacy and who has legitimate authority uh, and who is uh, adhering and defending uh, the constitutional order of Ethiopia and those who want to challenge that and think the constitutional order as was constructed uh, you know, two and a half decades ago, uh, whether that's relevant or not. Um, but, but before I sort of elaborate on that, I do, I do wanna answer your question, which is that I think what we're seeing to the extent uh, of refugee flows, the sort of internationalization of the conflict that I know Ambassador Feltman will talk about more at length, is this sort of explosive nature of the crisis that we're seeing uh, in Ethiopia, which was less true in the Yugoslavia context, right? And I think it's important to bear that in mind. I mean, the, the analogy that I've used is that actually, I think it's very hard to see this uh, unfolding in a way that the neighboring states don't ultimately get sucked in. Uh, I mean, certainly they're engaged politically. I think the big question is the extent to which they are uh, sucked in militarily. And that's a great, uh, I think, danger certainly for uh, not just regional peace and security, but international um, peace and security. Maybe just to talk briefly about sort of the situation on the ground as, as you asked. Look, we're, this is day 21 uh, of, a, of a law enforcement operation, as the government calls it, that was supposed to last uh, a matter of days. And I think it's important that we keep track of that, right? Because uh, as we sadly have learned from conflicts elsewhere, whether it's South Sudan or Yemen, other places on the planet, um, the current conflicts that, uh, that are afflicting the globe have rarely gotten better with age in the last couple of years, right? And so it gets important for us all to keep our eye focused on the duration of this because it's always very easy when uh, when uh, governments and others have launched military campaigns to assert that they will be quick and decisive. And yet the preponderance of evidence, at least over the last decade, is that they have been anything but. And I think there's really no reason to believe, as Zach suggested, that uh, that's going to be any different uh, in this context. And, and I think that's deeply worrying. Um, as you said, we've already seen uh, significant refugee flows out of the country. I think it's worth noting that these, these are not just refugees leaving from Tigray. Um, we're, already, we're seeing refugees into Sudan from other parts uh, of Ethiopia. Um, and while it's a little bit unclear what that represents, because I think, as you know, certainly sitting from afar, and I think we have to be humble about that, uh, and given a lot of the communications lockdowns and, and the extent to which um, political and civic freedoms have been curtailed not just in the last couple of weeks, uh, but uh, in the last, uh, particularly in the last five or six months, uh, really definitive information is hard to come by. But we do see refugees coming from other parts of the uh, other parts of Ethiopia than Tigray, which suggests um, uh, conflict, instability, insecurity uh, in other parts uh, of the re of the country. Uh, and I think again that that should be deeply worrisome in terms of the uh, the trajectory of the state uh, as a whole. We do also, as you as you said, Vanda, see uh, several hundred thousand, uh, up to uh, I think at least uh, half a million internal displacements newly in the last couple of weeks. Um, that comes on the heels of, frankly, uh, a, an internal displacement crisis that actually started in 2018. In Ethiopia had the largest internal displacements on the continent of Africa in the 2018-2019 period. And again, I think we saw from that it was attributed primarily to political instability. Uh, and I think um, what that indicates is that, again, this is not happening in a vacuum. <clears throat> Excuse me. What's happening with Tigray is not happening in a vacuum. It's actually been building for some time. Uh, and I think that's important uh, to note. Um, I would also add uh, and and, uh, and maybe stop with that. And I know we can elaborate on a, on a couple of other things uh, coming into this. I think we need to not lose sight of the, um, uh, as we look at the sort of national political and security crisis, the national economic crisis uh, that's been facing this country. Even prior to this war in early October, um, the IMF was projecting 0% uh, GDP growth for Ethiopia in 2021. That is down from 9% in 2019, uh, which dropped to 1.9% uh, uh, this year 
primarily because of COVID and the pandemic, but uh, for other factors as well. And so uh, when you're when the country is already headed into a pretty uh, nightmarish, frankly, economic scenario in 2021, uh, and we know, of course, from other experiences, how devastating uh, conflict either, uh, you know, in, in a one localized area or nationally can be uh, for the economic health uh, of a country. And indeed, for even some of the uh, the assistance that will be required externally to mitigate that, uh, because obviously the humanitarian demands uh, are escalating by the day, and resources, as we all know, internationally are finite and stretched. Uh, that's, I think, a pretty devastating scenario for Ethiopia, a country that, uh, just to keep pace with demographic growth, has needed to add two million jobs uh, per year, right, which it wasn't doing uh, prior to the onset of hostilities between the federal government uh, and Tigray. It wasn't doing prior to the instability we saw earlier this summer uh, after the assassination of a, 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 of a popular Romo singer and a lot of unrest that broke out of that. And so as we then head into this, uh, what is projected to be a, a, an even steeper economic decline for a number of other reasons, and you think about just the expenses that the federal government and others will incur uh, to fight whatever you want to call it, a law enforcement operation uh, or a conflict, uh, it's pretty hard to see how uh, that economic decline doesn't spiral further. And that, of course, has, uh, and I think can predictably have, uh, really devastating political uh, and economic consequences that will further exacerbate uh, the really significant polarization that we've already seen, uh, obviously quite evident uh, in, in the current situation. So I'll stop there and I know we'll have the opportunity to come back and talk uh, a little bit more as Zach suggested about um, maybe some principles and, and, and ways forward. Well, great, thank you. I'm very glad that you brought in the economic dimension, which is um, indeed significant, Ethiopia, for uh, much of the past 30 years had one of the highest growth, population growth rates uh, on the continent, an issue that was always very worrisome and troubling already during the uh, uh, Melissanavi era, the issue of how to keep uh, young people employed as they are coming of age and joining um, uh, or, or, light, or hoping to join the uh, to workforce was a key element of stability. And as you highlighted, this has now been severely compounded uh, by COVID from which uh, many a country will not be able to escape uh, as soon as a vaccine is available. A lot of the um, economic recovery uh, will likely take much longer and certainly human capital recovery uh, will often take even much longer than that as COVID forced people uh, to liquidate a lot of their human uh, development assets uh, in rather profound ways. Uh, and of course, that has another dimension, one of the effects of uh, lots of young unemployment of young people frequently is militias, ethnic militias, criminal militias, militias organized in other way, something that has been growing um, in Ethiopia uh, over the past uh, two years and that has deeper, longer uh, roots. So perhaps there's another dimension we can come to. But I would like to now a little bit expand from the inner to the outer to the explosiveness and um, ask you, Ambassador Felton, uh, to reflect on us, uh, to reflect with us on the region, on the role of uh, neighboring countries such as Eritrea, very important ones, as well as on uh, what has been happening with uh, international diplomacy in dealing with the situation so far. Hard to believe that even after months of this, that one still has to say that, I apologize. Um, it's an honor to be part of this panel, to be to to be included with such experts such as yourself, Fonda, and, and Zach and Zach and Peyton. When I look at Ethiopia right now, um, I can't help but think about all of the conversations that we had in the United Nations during the time I was in the United Nations with member states within the Secretariat about the importance of prevention. Everyone everyone agrees that it's far better to prevent a conflict than it is to try to resolve a conflict or to rebuild a country after it's been devastated by conflict. So prevention um, is sort of the mantra that people talk about when they're, when they're looking at countries that have internal tensions. Um, but this is a classic example, uh, a, a tragic example of why prevention is so hard in the international context and why prevention so rarely works when it comes to um, trying to prevent internal tensions from turning into, into conflict. I mean, as, as, as the previous speakers have all noted, that Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed um, describes this as an internal affair, a, pol a police affair. 
And the international system, the you know, centered on the United Nations in terms of peace and security was designed to prevent conflicts between, between states, to prevent, to, to provide off-roads to um, conflicts between member states. And this is an example of what is a conflict inside a member state where, where we can all term it as a, as a threat to international peace and security, but the um, national authorities that hold the seat at the Security Council will say, this is an this is an internal matter. This is not this is not an external an external matter. Um, I think we all you know we've seen it, it's it's very well known the um, antipathy that Asmara has for the TPLF. That that's a, that that's part of the basis on which the the um, Isaias um, Avi rapprochement from a couple of years ago was 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 based. So I think all of us are watching with great concern. Um, what Eritrea's view will view to, to this will be, what Eritrea's involvement will be. And you have, there's been a lot of speculation about, about um, involvement from further, from further afield. You know, the, the United Arab Emirates has a very um, unique access in this region because they have good relations with Asmara, good relations with, with Abi, good relations in Khartoum, good relations in, 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 in Egypt. What is, what is the UAE doing in terms of terms of this? I mean, in theory, right now, the drive should be toward some sort of of mediation, some sort of negotiation, leading up to those three points that Zach that Zach was talking about that he'll that he'll elaborate on further. Um, because the right now you have the international community coming together behind an initiative that um, that derives from the African Union. You know, the African Union often talks about um, African solutions for African problems. And South African um, President um, Ramaphosa is currently the AU, the AU chair, occupies the AU chair. On November 20th last week, um, he met with um, Sahli Warkzaudi, the president of Ethiopia, who was there, who went to South Africa as a special envoy from Prime Minister Abiy. And at the, Prime Minister, uh, President Ramaphosa announced an initiative with um, three mediators, three former presidents from Africa, um, uh, President Chisano, President um, Johnson Sirleaf, President Motlanthi, asking for mediation. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, immediately um, backed this mediation. Um, There's a very interesting and encouraging statement from Adela Ben Zayed, the UAE Foreign Minister, two days later, also backing the Ramaphosa initiative, Ramaphosa initiative and calling for, for calling for dialogue. Um, you had the EU High Representative Joseph Borrell, who appointed a special envoy, Pekka Havisto, the current Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs of uh, Finland, um, who has extensive experience and contacts in the Horn as his special envoy to try to back the Ramaphosa initiative. You had the a little bit a little bit later. The U.S. National Security Council last night indicated support for this. So the international community is coming together behind an initiative um, by the African Union that would look to that would that would provide mediation and lead to national dialogue process. The problem is that so far, um, Addis Ababa, Prime Minister um, Abiy, has been, has remained rather cold to this initiative, and this again illustrates the broader problem we have internationally when one tries to um, tries to mediate or prevent a conflict from getting worse, which is the, which is that the member state sovereignty in these sorts of matters still still matter. There's a very interesting um, de development in New York overnight at the at the United Nations, which I think illustrates the type of tools we have to try to encourage Prime Minister Abi um, to look more favorably at the international, at the regional international call for mediation. Um, the, three, the three members of the African group who sit in the Security Council now, Niger, South Africa, um, and Tunisia, along with St. Ben, uh, um, Vincent and Grenadines, they call themselves the A3 plus one, a small block inside the Security Council, called for a Security Council briefing today this morning on the situation in Ethiopia with an emphasis on the South African, on, on Chairman, Chairperson Ramaphosa's initiative. Today, this morning, the A3 plus one withdrew that announcement. That suggests to me that 
the request for a Security Council briefing was designed to, to exert a little leverage, exert a little pressure. Does Prime Minister Abiy really wish the Security Council to discuss what's happening in Ethiopia, or wouldn't he rather look more favorably at the type of African mediation proposed by, by President Ramaphosa? There's a, an added twist to that, which is that after the A3 plus one withdrew their request for a briefing this morning, the European members of the Security Council retabled it. So right now, there is some, right now um, at the conclusion of, a, of another Security Council meeting, um, it happens to be on Iraq, there's, there's intended to be a briefing, closed door briefing to Security Council members on the situation in, in Ethiopia. But one would hope that all of this regional and external encouragement of mediation would lead to, the, to an opening for the type of dialogue that um, would replace moving toward a Grozny type military solution to the problem. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. And we will come um, uh, back to uh, uh, further opportunities for international engagement and domestic resolution. I will um, uh, turn back to Zach in a few moments uh, to give him a chance to uh, elaborate further uh, the uh, proposals that he uh, put uh, on the table that he prefaced and that were in his um, uh, impactful uh, Brookings blog. But before I do that, uh, let me reflect for um, a few minutes on Zach's uh, comments that uh, what's different about Ethiopia, unlike Yugoslavia, is that we are not looking at an implosion, but rather than an explosion. And specifically, let me reflect on what the situation in Ethiopia means for Somalia. Uh, the, the focus of the region has been, uh, the focus of the world and of the region has been on Ethiopia and rightly so because uh, the situation, should it become a lasting uh, and increasingly complex civil war, uh, would be indeed disastrous. But, if he, but Somalia is uh, going through its own set of crises and uh, very dangerous moments uh, that are very directly impacted by Ethiopia. The sort of triple crisis is, is brewing over Somalia. Uh, the first dimension, the one that I'll come back to, uh, is precisely the impact of uh, Ethiopia and the role of Ethiopian forces in Somalia, both uh, in its fight against Al-Shabaab, but also in its own very complex and highly fraught relations between the center and periphery, between Mogadishu and federal member states. And this, this immediate uh, impact uh, is taking place at the time uh, where the center periphery tensions are really at their highest uh, in years, um, in, in a very long time, and where they already were um, explosive and did explode into violent encounters between federal member states and the Somali federal government over the past uh, two years. And they are also taking place as Somalia is heading into parliamentary elections next month and presidential elections um, in February. That like in um, Ethiopia were delayed. Uh, at the, under the best of circumstances, the um, elections uh, are difficult to execute. There are enormous threats of violence from Al-Shabaab, but also a smaller actor, but nonetheless, um, at least locally potent one, the Islamic State. Um, but uh, they are all the more complex in, this, in, in the current uh, moment, where there is high chance that losers in the elections will uh, reject uh, the outcomes. And where many um, uh, powerful presidents of uh, member states uh, in places like uh, Patland and uh, Jubaland have very um, hostile relations with uh, Somalia's president, um, Mohammed Abdullahi Mohammed, and uh, do not uh, pray for his uh, re-elections. So th there is high possibility of both a uh, violent rebellion like in Tigray against the uh, outcome of the elections, but also a violent response by federal Somali forces as um, there have been prior attempts uh, to do so. And the third dimensions of this context is of course that um, the United States, the Trump administration announced a uh, very precipitous withdrawal of the uh, US special, Asian, special operations forces that are placed uh, in Somalia about um, um, 
750 of them. That seems like a small number, particularly in comparison to our deployments uh, in places like Afghanistan and Iraq at the height of the crisis. But nonetheless, the US Special Operations Forces have had several critical roles. One is to uh, support uh, and train the special um, uh, counterterrorism force uh, called DANAB uh, that doesn't have the capacity to defeat Al Shabaab, um, doesn't have the capacity to turn the strategic situation uh, around, but nonetheless has been key to disrupting major terrorist attacks. Secondly, and very importantly, uh, the role of the US Special Operations Forces has been to enable drone and airstrikes. And while they are controversial and often generate or, or often are alleged to generate civilian casualties, and sometimes they do generate civilian casualties, these strikes have also been critical in preventing Al Shabaab from massing. Uh, without them or in the decline of them, Shabaab will find it far easier to run over Amisom bases or bases of Ethiopian and Kenyan forces that operate independently, not under the Amisom rubric, let alone of Somali National Army and militias. And finally, both the presence of US Special Operations Forces and the Ethiopian forces has been uh, really critical for uh, stiffening the spine of um, anti-Shabaab militias. Those militias are the primary actors, and with the exception of DANAP and US Special Operations Forces, the only actor that still conduct offensive operations against Shabaab. Since 2017, AMISOM, as well as independent Ethiopian forces, have essentially been a garrison mode, uh, rarely patrolling, but not, uh, certainly not conducting offensive operations. And we have seen a steady, systematic, and significant decline in security, with Al Shabaab nowhere as strong as in uh, 2010, 2011, but far stronger uh, than several years ago, having reached across the country, having the capacity to take over cities, even though um, uh, it has struggled to hold cities, uh, controlling roads, having extensive um, freedom of operation. And it is often said in Somalia when I was there in January that the reason Al Shabaab doesn't conduct attacks is because everyone pays Al Shabaab or at least very many great actors paid Al Shabaab. And then attack is specifically precipitated when the payment is not delivered. So um, each time we have seen Ethiopian uh, forces withdrawn, Al Shabaab has taken over greater territory as well as murdered uh, local government officials. Uh, or um, local clan elders working uh, with the government. And of course, if the Ethiopia crisis goes on long time, there might be significant pressures and demand to withdraw more Ethiopian forces that could bring about an unraveling of uh, the Amazon force. And already as it is, the, the extensive purges and detention of Tigray government employees are also being manifested. Uh, in Somalia, where Tigray officers and soldiers have been disarmed, uh, placed in uh, barracks under, under uh, detention or uh, shipped to uh, Somalia. So, uh, shipped to Ethiopia from Somalia. So, rather rapidly, uh, come um, February, March of next year, we could see very significant uh, conflict exploding around Somalia. Um, both pulling in Ethiopia, but also impacting Ethiopia and pulling in some of the same regional actors in very complex ways, such as the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, um, and other actors. So stabilizing Ethiopia uh, is both crucial for uh, the people of Ethiopia, uh, but it's also crucial for Somalia and uh, the Horn. Zach, let me now go back to you. Stabilizing Ethiopia is crucial. How to go about it? You have uh, sketched um, your, your core thoughts. Can you please elaborate them further and also uh, deal with the challenge that, that uh, uh, Ambassador Feldman spoke about, namely that Prime Minister Abiy has so far uh, not been responsive to the international diplomatic efforts and calls for uh, a dialogue? Sure, thanks, Vanda. Um... I will, I'll, I'll make two contextual points on your questions about the calls for negotiations uh, and then revisit the kind of three baseline points for uh, negotiation in, in, the, in the context of the mediation that Ambassador Feldman has laid out for us. Um, just this morning, uh, I asked a senior Ethiopian government official again about negotiations uh, 
uh, and you get two familiar replies. Uh, and I think this this may shed some light or, or uh, on on how the rest of us, the international community, can uh, can try to uh, push the parties towards talks. Um, first, uh, as Jeff and Peyton have both mentioned, a claim that this military campaign is a narrow law enforcement operation. Now they're doing this both for internal and external audiences and for various reasons. And while there are individuals and, and groups uh, responsible for violence, for corruptions, for acts trying to undermine the state, uh, it, it's, it's obviously patently false to characterize the situation uh, now complete with tanks and artillery and a military siege and tens of thousands of refugees flowing across international borders, reports of large scale atrocities on both sides. It's very hard to call that a police operation. Uh, it's really a war between the state and one of its ethno-regional uh, substates. Uh, secondly, uh, on the calls for negotiations, uh, this official reiterated points made by others in his government that we've been hearing, that dialogue of any kind would create a false equivalence with the TPLF. TPLF, it would lift them up, it would, it would mean impunity. And I don't think that's right. Um, negotiations, uh, halting this now uh, and having a negotiation process uh, can be entirely consistent with calls for accountability. Um, again, as I mentioned at the outset, there's a lot of anger about the TPLF for its period of repressive government governance, uh, its provocations since it was ousted from power, but that does not mean that prosecuting an all-out war, including civilian centers in Tigray, is acceptable either. It isn't. Uh, the military campaign, the threats, the civilian cost are doing a, a good bit to obscure uh, the government's concerns about the TPLF and instead highlight their own overreach. Um, so on the mediation, um, very quickly, uh, I wanna mention uh, the Ethiopia's most significant foreign partner over the last two decades, uh, which hasn't been mentioned other than by you, Vanda, in the context of Somalia, but we haven't really discussed yet in terms of Ethiopia, and that is the United States. United States, which might have been an ideal broker, uh, or at least a, a very strong player uh, behind the African Union, uh, but it really worked itself out of the picture here in a way that's uh, rather unfortunate. Um, and that's due in part because of uh, the Trump administration's uh, unhelpful positioning in, in negotiations between Egypt and Ethiopia over the Nile waters, when it threw its support behind Cairo, uh, the administration really surrendered U.S. Credi credibility there in Addis Ababa. Um, and then sort of switching whole scale uh, since the outset of the conflict, uh, we've seen the embassy and the State Department seem to be mostly echoing the government's position that this is a law enforcement operation, uh, as well as the military analysis that this will be over in very short order, uh, which again, I think we all agree here uh, is incorrect. Um, now, fortunately, yesterday, uh, we saw the National Security Council put out a new message saying that the U.S. supported a negotiated end of the conflict uh, and supported the work of the AU envoys. Uh, be better late than never. Uh, I understand a call from the State Department reiterated the same to Addis Ababa, uh, though it didn't necessarily come from a high, high enough level, uh, and it certainly should. Um, so with those two points of context, um, on the mediation itself, Jeff has outlined the African Union envoys I, I do think a negotiated settlement is possible, uh, especially as battlefield gains diminish, forces on both sides are stressed, resources dry up, uh, and hopefully international pressure to stop the fighting continues to mount. Um, I do say, think, uh, just as one point of uh, analysis here, and, and by no means a value judgment, uh, I imagine both sides uh, are going to want to claim some kind of win before they're willing to talk, uh, politically, for domestic purposes, uh, you know, if, if for the federal government, Abi pulls back the reins, uh, but is able to arrest and charge some TPLF leaders for crimes committed, uh, he could conceivably claim that he's responded to unlawful attacks and other provocations. Uh, for the TPLF, they can claim survival, that they held off the government's assault and were able to uh, push for a broader dialogue. Again, I'm not, I'm not uh, 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 supporting either of those. I'm just saying I think that uh, could be a point of context as the mediators begin to approach that. Um, now, on the on the ideas themselves, uh, again, these are based on conversations with Ethiopians, both inside and outside the country, uh, and Ethiopians on all sides. I'll just revisit those now. And again, I think these are points that could serve as a baseline for the African Union uh, envoys. Uh, the first, again, is a cessation of hostilities. Uh, 
this would include redeployment, uh, questions about control of the Northern Command that's at the center of this conflict, uh, a monitoring mechanism to prevent uh, flare-ups between now and new elections, humanitarian quarters, et cetera. Um, in the long run, security forces, including military, uh, police, irregular militia, of which there are many, uh, will need to be restructured, but that's a conversation uh, for the after, after the elections and based on a new constitutional dispensation. Um, second uh, is the hard one. I mentioned this at the outset, some kind of mutual acknowledgement of legitimacy. Uh, as, as the idea uh, the De Grey and regional government could acknowledge the legitimacy of Abi's government in a transitional capacity and tell the convening of, of national elections uh, next year. In turn, uh, Prime Minister Abi could acknowledge that the mandate of Tigray's regional authority uh, by way of its September 2020 elections could be accepted as the legitimate transitional authority as well. Um, now, I think the outer bounds of these respective authorities could be delineated. Uh, and as I said, normalizing measures could flow from this kind of mutual declaration. Um, that would include restoration of federal funds to Tigray, uh, uh, the turning back on of the lights, the telecommunications and trade links, uh, release of political prisoners, uh, and as I've mentioned a few times, uh, accountability for, uh, for violence and other crimes committed during the transition period to date. Um, again, I, I, I agree with Peyton and Fullier. This is not only about what's happened over the last two weeks, but it's what's happened over the last two years, and not only in Tigray. And I think this can and should be put in that larger context. And that brings me to the third and final point, and that is uh, dialogue, uh, a political dialogue starting now before elections. So a renewed political dialogue uh, addressing both the terms, the playing field in which elections could take place, um, and the timing as well. It, it can expand on some existing efforts towards dialogue, again, and involve not only Addis Ababa and uh, Mekele, but leaders of all 10 federal states and Ethiopians of all backgrounds, uh, politically, ideologically, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the path to new elections, a new date, and some kind of constitutional convention to decide uh, what changes will be made to the 1995 constitutions so as to resolve those core questions I outlined in my opening remarks uh, about the nature of the state. Um, that's not kind of comprehensive. Uh, it shouldn't, it's not, it, it need not be something that impo be imposed from the outside, uh, but again, a baseline to begin those conversations. Uh, these things always appear impossible until they aren't. Uh, and it requires uh, the United Front from the international community that Jeff uh, mentioned uh, to continue to press the parties to stop and, and go to the negotiating table. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Zaik. Peyton, if I can turn to you for your take on policy recommendations and perhaps also some of the deeper um, issues. So one set of policy recommendations is, of course, uh, resolving the immediate military conflict uh, and um, starting uh, to have capacity to deal with the humanitarian situation, which is dire, and yet um, humanitarian uh, aid has not been able to flow. But the larger issue is the one how uh, Ethiopia, just like Somalia, resolves the balance of power between uh, the capital and the regions and how that can be done in a way that uh, prevents instead of encourages uh, other conflict. Um, your thoughts on uh, any of those issues, please. Thank you, Vanda. Yeah, let me offer two uh, maybe points to respond to your question, then if I may briefly uh, zoom out, because I'd like to pick up on something that you mentioned with respect to Somalia and sort of the broader uh, changes in the region and the extent to which Ethiopian foreign policy has actually changed, uh, I think, fairly substantially over the last uh, you know, two years as well. Um, in terms of sort of the political, um, you know, a political initiative going forward, I think there's uh, the way I think about it actually is maybe in two particular ways. I think um, there was a very interesting piece this morning by former Prime Minister uh, Haile Mariam Dessalin that I think uh, raised the sort of, uh, it, it was essentially an argument against power sharing. And I think we have to be clear as we think about what sort of political formula might be the way out of uh, this military confrontation, that we don't uh, think that power sharing is the only answer for ending a conflict. We have sort of broadly, internationally speaking, somehow fallen into this trap that power sharing formulas are the only ways that one can construct a political settlement. And I think it's important very much to Zach's 
point, uh, which I agree with uh, the formula that he's laid out. But I think you know there is it, it, maybe power sharing isn't the relevant formula out of the current uh, confrontation between the federal government and Tigre. Uh, I think, frankly, probably it's not uh, in terms of coming up with something that addresses the nationwide political crisis that we've been talking about. But that does not mean that a political solution isn't possible, right? What it means is that we have to be very creative and think about broadly speaking, how, how uh, the, the underlying issues and drivers of the national political and security crisis can be best addressed. And if that's not power sharing, I, I think that's a perfectly reasonable argument to make. Uh, but that does not mean that a military solution or a law enforcement operation uh, is the only way forward, right? What it means is that, uh, you know, creativity and some political imagination is, is important uh, and needs to be brought to bear. Uh, the second point that I would make is, is this question about sort of the constitutional order. And, and I want to say first and foremost that I would commend to everyone a piece that my colleague Ali Burji uh, from the U.S. Institute of Peace just uh, wrote for our website actually this morning about this question of elections, because I think there's this um, there's an argument that has been made, I think, primarily by the government, but is also circulating internationally that, you know, you have a law enforcement operation and then the elections that were delayed uh, because of the pandemic can sort of quickly be held, you know, in March or, or April. And therefore, you will then, via those elections, restore the sort of legitimacy of the various parties. And politics aside, and the need for, for sort of diplomatic solution, as Zach and others have laid out notwithstanding, uh, I think we have to be very clear-eyed about the technical barriers to holding elections in that time frame, right? And, and I think that all also argues then for what are some other mechanisms for dealing with this crisis of legitimacy that is, affect, affects many actors, uh, many of the political stakeholders uh, in Ethiopia at the moment, outside of elections, because I'm not sure that's a viable way forward in the time frame or along the time horizon uh, that we're talking about here. Um, I think it's equally imperative that whether it's um, whether it's uh, Western powers, the United States, whether it's multilateral actors, whether it's the initiative by a very important initiative as Ambassador Feltman mentioned um, by uh, the African Union and, and President Ramaphosa, um, that uh, there's a clear message conveyed to all Ethiopian political stakeholders that the Ethiopian constitutional order cannot be changed by force in the interim, that that is only a recipe for further polarization, further violence, further breakdown uh, of, of, uh, of, the, of the state, frankly, and of the arrangement uh, and the very fraught, clearly, relationship between center uh, and periphery. Uh, USIP, uh, I think as folks know, had, had, uh, uh, was honored to facilitate a uh, senior study group for the last year and a half of which Ambassador Feldman was a part of uh, on uh, peace and security in the Red Sea. And uh, the report came out about a month ago and uh, just before actually uh, this conflict broke out in Ethiopia. And the group also issued a statement making this point that uh, the constitutional order cannot be changed by force or by fiat. And I think it's really important uh, as a international community that we not lose lose sight of that. Um, the last point uh, I would make just quickly on your on your humanitarian uh, question, Vanda, is clearly there's a, a, a enormous humanitarian crisis unfolding in the country. I think uh, you know you see lots of numbers and projections thrown out there. I think everyone should prepare themselves. Uh, I mean, I, I very much agree, of course, that there's not a military solution I mean, to the extent that a military campaign in Tigray or elsewhere uh, unfolds. We should prepare ourselves for a humanitarian crisis that is of a scope and scale that, frankly, the international has, community has not seen in some decades. I think I mentioned this uh, when we had the event uh, at the end of September, but just to remind. Ethiopia is five times the size by population of pre-war Syria. So this notion that even 200,000 refugees, you know, uh, could come out and that can sort of be planned for, I think is a significant underestimate. It's also critically important that we recognize that humanitarian corridors are not the answer here. There needs to be unhindered humanitarian access that is predicated on need uh, and urgency not on a negotiation about certain access points with the government that's not going to be effective uh, and it's frankly not consistent with international humanitarian law uh, in this in this context. Um, and then just finally on the region, I think uh, what we haven't talked about today and probably merits its own event is is the uh, uh, the sort of revolution actually in, in Ethiopian foreign policy that President Abiy, uh, rather Prime Minister Abiy has, has engineered. And I think you mentioned Somalia 
Vanda. And one of the things that strikes me is um, Ethiopia for many decades, uh, certainly even prior to the EPRDF regime, had um, prided itself on multilateral engagement, right? Whether it's the UN system and the important role it's played in peacekeeping, going back to the Korean War, um, whether it's uh, it's uh, Ethiopia's leadership in EGAD, and you've seen a real sea change in that, right? There's a real tension between uh, EGAD, for example, uh, frankly, uh, and, uh, and whether Ethiopia is invested in that or not, vice a different arrangement between Ethiopia Somalia and Eritrea in sort of a new uh, regional uh, confrontation. There had been, at least uh, up until the last two and a half years, a certain role played by um, the federal, by the states themselves of Ethiopia in foreign policy. So certainly Tigray with respect to Eritrea, but also Amhara with Amhara region with respect to Sudan, the Somali region with respect to Somalia. They had a role and a voice in how Ethiopian foreign policy uh, was conducted. And similar to a number of the other political developments we've seen uh, domestically, I think we've also seen an attempt to centralize foreign policy making, frankly, in Addis, uh, that is a bit different and a bit a, a pretty a significant change actually from the past. Uh, and I think that's worth noting because it does have ramifications, uh, for example, with respect to Ethiopia-Sudan relations, a very uh, contested border there between Amhara region and Sudan. Uh, and so as we look at um, a political formula, a political process uh, with international backing led by the African Union, I think it's also important to recognize that Prime Minister Abiy tends to approach foreign relations uh, very differently than his predecessors. Uh, and that's not necessarily a criticism. It's just that I think it informs and in some ways is illustrated by, as Ambassador Feltman pointed out, uh, how action in the United Nations has unfolded. Uh, it's indicative to some extent, as you rightly noted, Vonda, about um, uh, the withdrawal, at least of Tigrayan uh, elements of, of uh, some of the peacekeeping forces uh, in Somalia. Um, UN uh, had it or, or Amazon had it, peacekeeping forces. So uh, I think you know, this is a different uh, to some ways, the, the scope and change of Ethiopian politics has been hard to keep up with domestically, but there's been an equally profound change in, uh, in Ethiopian foreign policy in the last two and a half years. And, and so I think we all have to play catch up to that as well as we think about what the appropriate and constructive role is, either regional actors with Ethiopia's neighbors or uh, uh, international stakeholders further afield uh, in a political process. Right, thank you. Um, you know, several things you uh, uh, said, Peyton, uh, the role of uh, federal states or regions in foreign policy, major echo in Somalia, of course, including the contestation over who has a right to conduct any dimension of foreign policy. Uh, and also the issue of uh, the electoral uh, timetable. Are elections uh, in March in Ethiopia realistic? and our elections in Somalia in December and February, realistic. I'll uh, come um, to those points in my few uh, key points of recommendations. But before I do that, Jeff, if I can turn to you, please, um, uh, for your uh, policy advice on either the next steps or larger um, uh, frameworks and, and visions, possibilities of how to address the deeper issues in Ethiopia and prevent um, an emergence uh, of a conflict of a similar kind in other uh, parts of the country. Thanks, Vanda. Um, you know, I've heard people talk about um, Ethiopia and, whether, and I just guess it at, at perhaps the power sharing point that, that, that Peyton was making, the power, that power sharing is traditionally described is not always the right solution. Because people have asked me, Jeff, you were ambassador in Lebanon. Is a Lebanon-like solution um, a good idea for for Ethiopia? And I would say absolutely not. That what the, the what the Lebanon-type sectarian approach has meant is that yes, it stopped the the bloodletting of the of the Lebanese civil war, um, but it froze the it actually converted the conflict into one that was a competition that 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 froze the um, in place the sectarian divisions. Um, in a way that encouraged warlordism, corruption, it basically paralyzed the system. And it took, and of course we've seen Lebanon collapse um, politically and economically over the, over the past year. And so I would say that, that, that the type of, of rigid sectarian system that Lebanon had, Lebanon had is not the right solution for um, Ethiopia. Um, 
and we've seen similar things happening you know, with the with the with dysfunction in Iraq. It basically locks that sort of thing locks in place um, a dysfunction to the system that's then hard to break out of. You know, I've been thinking, Vanda, about if I were still at the UN, what's the UN agenda right now that could try to prom- that could pr- try to promote um, a more momentum toward the um, toward toward the cessation of hostilities, uh, mutual recognition, and dialogue that, that Zach. I think is very sensibly outlined. Um, and part of it is what is the what is really happening? We don't really know for sure what is happening. We don't have access to the, the conflict areas in a way that would provide the information we would need to be able to make judgments. And all of us are hearing contradictory information. We're all hearing this happened, that happened, um, and we have no way of, 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 of confirming it. So I would want to try to get as get people if not on the ground, at least nearby, or at least make the appearance of trying to trying to deploy people. This not only would, would if it works, give us access to information we, that we don't have now about what is really going on, it would also raise the pressure on the parties, um, realizing that the international community is not going to simply avert its eyes. It's going to, it's going to try to keep watching and moving. To, and that, might, that might increase the pressure for for the for cessation of hostilities and dialogue and mediation. For example, I think that one thing that you know one thing that, that the UN could call for would be for a emergency joint mission of the human rights rapporteurs. Imagine if you had the special rapporteur for extrajudicial summary or arbitrary execution, that's that's Agnes Calamar, um, with the special representative for the right to food. Since, since humanitarian access and food seems to be a um, weapon here, who is a Lebanese, uh, Michael Fakhri, along with the special representative of internally displaced persons, who's Filipina, um, and a special representative on contemporary forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. If you had a, if you had a high profile um, emergency joint mission of these four special rapporteurs, if not, if they didn't have access to Ethiopia itself, because of sovereign concerns, perhaps they could be talking to the people who are leaving Ethiopia, the, the, the refugees. That would that would raise attention, raise the type of spotlight that would put those that are looking at military solutions, they're looking at purging, um, purging institutions under some pressure, under some pressure. Um, and these rapporteurs are relatively independent once they've been given their mandate by the Human Rights Council. I don't think that they need a Security Council blessing or anything like that. They can decide on their own, assuming that they have travel travel budget for that. You also have an acting special representative for the prevention of genocide, um, Pramila Patton. I'm not, you know, I, none of us know, none of us would say that right now we, we can, we would say definitively there's genocide taking place. But if you look at the, if you look at the, at the hate speech, at the incitement, at the purging of various institutions, one could say that one needs to prevent this from turning into genocide. So the, the acting SRG for the prevention of genocide for the UN could be making statements, trying to travel, um, looking at what to do. There's also the special advisor on, on responsibility to protect the R, R2P, Karen Smith, who happens to be South African. Um, there's also a special representative, and there's also the Secretary General Special Representative for the Horn of Africa. There, there's, the UN has tools if the UN would choose to use them. Um, the Secretary General on his own could create a fact-finding mission. Um, this has happened. This happened after Benazir Bhutto's um, assassination. It happened after Gaza Wars, um, where the Secretary General using his own authorities created a fact-finding mission. These sorts of things can not only help reveal what's actually going on, but put pressure on the parties to, to um, move toward talks rather than war because they don't want to be investigated by this stuff. And of course, you've also got the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed, who is African, um, who has who's very much a proponent of that of that phrase, African solutions for African problems. Who could be deployed? I also note that the Secretary General, the current Secretary General, in one of his um, first acts in office, created a high-level advisory panel on, on mediation. That high-level advisory panel on mediation includes some very prominent Africans, including Ramtan Lamamra, who's, who's who leads the Silencing the Guns Initiatives for the African Union, was former African Union Peace and Security Commissioner. It includes former um, Nigerian President Abasanjo, who I think would be a very um, effective. 
um, advocate for moving away from military from from the from a military approach. It also has um, several other on um, Graham and Michelle several several others. So I believe that member states of the United Nations need to start putting pressure on the UN, on the Secretary General and others to deploy the tools that already exist to try to bring us the information that we would need to, to, to better understand what's actually happening and to put pressure on the parties by shining this international spotlight in a way that, that, that might help unlock that door towards cessation of violence, recognition and, and dialogue that Zach has outlined. Well, thanks very uh, much, Chef. You know, the issue of um, the UN role and uh, regional engagement is also key for Somalia, um, where uh, an immediate critical dimension uh, uh, to me seems to be real need to engage both President Mohammed uh, and uh, other uh, Somali politicians, particularly those in opposition to him, such as uh, Jubalan's President Ahmed Madobe, and uh, Butland's president, uh, Danny, but as well as uh, clan elders, not to uh, use the elections and its outcome, however frustrating, uh, into opportunities to uh, resolve uh, or at least advance their agenda of center periphery tensions uh, through violence and arms. We are hearing various um, rumors about uh, multiple forms of arming up going in Somalia, including among clans in Mogadishu, that is significant. Uh, President Mohammed uh, has also built up his own nominally non-armed corps, um, more of a political um, cadre uh, in Mogadishu, but one can imagine how that could slip into uh, arming up as well. And now that is difficult because there is no regional consensus. Uh, United Arab Emirates is close to uh, uh, the uh, governments in Patland uh, and other regions of Somalia. Um, Kenya has supported uh, uh, Jubaland and uh, Ahmed Madobe, while uh, Ethiopia has closely supported uh, uh, President Mohammed and has helped President Mohammed um, violently confront um, his uh, opponents. Uh, so the, the chance that uh, any kind of electoral violence will escalate into uh, potential violence among regional actors is not insignificant. And already in the spring, Kenya and Ethiopia came really very close to blows in Jubaland precisely over these um, issues, even though they are both uh, also part of um, Amisom. Now, the second point I would like to make to connect with uh, Peyton's comments, there is good reason to um, uh, postpone the elections in Somalia by a short amount of time. And what I, what I mean by that is something like two or three months. This, would, this could not be done by fiat. This could not be just declaration from Mogadishu, but would require consensual agreement from other Somali leaders. Why? Because the elections are absolutely unprepared. They are to take place in um, two, three weeks, yet uh, neither the broader setup issues of how disputes are going to be resolved uh, or the physical organization of voting uh, for the electoral colleges um, has really been uh, completed. And there are virtually no security plans for holding the elections. Uh, in the prior elections, AMISOM was uh, an important actor. The role of AMISOM today has been very much uh, hands-off, distant approach. Some, uh, elect some uh, thinking towards securing elections has been done, but it's very much uh, um, uh, it, it's, it's very incomplete and really inadequate given the immense violent dangers uh, that can take place. And finally, uh, the Trump administration is, is rushing to withdraw the US Special Operations Forces. Um, that may not be um, uh, changeable at this point, but nonetheless, if there is any scope to delay that withdrawal, at least uh, after the uh, uh, Somalia elections take place, that would be highly desirable. And then we can have a, uh, another event and mile uh, whether US Special Operations Forces should or should not stay in Somalia at the, uh, for a longer term. But the current um, withdrawal is uh, really just the worst time to, to pick uh, uh, for the withdrawal and clearly uh, adopted without really paying any attention to the, to the repercussions for um, Somalia's safety. Zach had um, a very important piece on way forward in Somalia 
I, uh, in um, Ethiopia, rather, I had two blogs on Somalia over the past few days in which I go into further steps, not just the immediate ones, but also medium term. But I'm not going to go into those and instead now go to um, uh, questions from the audience. The questions uh, were submitted uh, uh, by email at the time of uh, registration, subsequently sent in, and they have also been coming in as we have been sp uh, speaking. Uh, there are right now about uh, 60 questions that obviously we cannot uh, um, uh, go through all of them in the remaining uh, 20 minutes of the talk. But I will uh, uh, bundle sets of questions together and pick those that have not been um, explicitly um, addressed. And since we were just talking about the region, let me start with the regional question uh, for, for all of you. There are specifically questions about uh, what um, is the impact on Sudan, uh, but also whether Sudan has uh, tried to be involved in the Tigray um, Addis uh, crisis. A related question, similar question, what is the role of Egypt in all of this? Has Egypt engaged in any kind of active diplomacy or indirect support? To whom, how? And um, a whole set of questions that raise uh, the issue of Egypt and the um, great Ethiopian Renaissance then. Whether this is an opportunity for Egypt to try to sabotage the filling of the dam, uh, or conversely, how does the internal crisis impact on what will happen with the dam? So, you know, Egypt, Sudan, uh, and any other uh, regional dimensions that you would like to uh, bring. Um, perhaps you can just uh, unmute. I saw uh, Zach coming uh, online. Zach, uh, let me go to you first. Sure. Uh, I certainly think we all agree on the, uh, the very real uh, regional implications. Uh, and, and, you know, the fact that uh, Ethiopia is the kind of political and economic and security linchpin of the entire region is, is really not just a nice talking point. Um, if we think of the immediate region, Eritrea, Sudan, as you mentioned, Somalia, Djibouti, Kenya, all of these states are connected by very real uh, issues, land, resources, water and electricity, trade, economics, security, and ethnic overlap across every border. So any weakening of the state in Ethiopia uh, inside or conflict spillover outside, I think will invite uh, very real changes in these border regions uh, and, and changes with regard to national foreign policy at the, at the level of capitals, uh, possibly even involvement directly in Ethiopia's conflict as we've already seen uh, in different ways, directly or indirectly from Eritrea. Um, your point about Sudan, I think, uh, we could talk about at great length, given its unique position. Uh, Tigray is obviously cut off uh, from the, uh, the outside world by Eritrea to the north uh, and, and uh, opposing regions inside Ethiopia. And so they're in very real uh, trouble in terms of logistics, in terms of food, in terms of supplies. Uh, and that, that impacts, as we know, not only the TPLF and their ability to, uh, to fight, but also ordinary populations. So, so Sudan and whether or not it opens that border uh, officially or unofficially, uh, what is let in and, and out um, is a very real uh, variable, very important variable in what we see going forward. Um, then just briefly, zooming out, and, and this has been referenced a bit, but zooming out and we look at Ethiopia in, in an even wider context, uh, this sort of broader Red Sea region, uh, and this is the project I, I work on specifically at Brookings, um, there is a huge uh, amount of additional investment in each of these areas in Ethiopia. If we think about Turkey, uh, Turkey has more economic investments in Ethiopia than anywhere in the region, and we've seen them uh, engaged with Ethiopian leadership over the last week. Uh, the UAE, as Jeff outlined, uh, bailed out Ethiopia's economy, helped out with foreign reserves early in Abiy's tenure. They've really tried to uh, cement a relationship there. Uh, the UAE has this military base uh, in partnership with the Saudis uh, right next door in Eritrea, uh, which they have un likewise underwritten with cash and investments. Um, the Qataris have sought to improve their own relations in Ethiopia. Uh, and, and huge numbers of Ethiopians, lest we forget, were before this conflict already flowing, and I think Peyton may have mentioned this, huge numbers of Ethiopians were already flowing across uh, the Red Sea uh, to Yemen uh, and beyond, making their way to jobs uh, and, and or safety uh, in other places across the Gulf. Uh, 
Um, and last, uh, but far from least, as you mentioned, is Egypt, of course, and, and uh, Cairo being locked in a contest over control of the Nile with Addis Ababa. Um, I don't know. I, I'd welcome others' thoughts on this. I, I think that would be a very dangerous calculation uh, for Ethiopian security or intelligence to try to take advantage of this. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but I think it could prove uh, especially dangerous. I think it's hard um, in some ways for any Ethiopian faction uh, to sort of uh, link up uh, with uh, Egypt on this, in part because the dam is such a, an issue of national pride and of national identity and was championed in the first place by the TPLF itself. So I think that is definitely something to watch uh, and something with potentially huge implications, but I think it's hard. Uh, I, I don't see an easy path to that. I'll, I'll stop there and leave to others. Oh, thanks, uh, Peyton and Jeff, please come in, but um, uh, Zach's uh, uh, remarks just now and his uh, mentioning the work at Brookings on uh, Red Sea also brings to mind China, which obviously has um, sought to expand uh, its role in Africa, including in East Africa. There have been talks of the scramble for Africa. Uh, China has a presence uh, in um, uh, Somalia and obviously uh, as was said multiple times, Ethiopia is the linchpin of Horn of Africa securities. Um, and if Ethiopia were to unravel, this is sending shockwaves throughout the entire region. What has uh, China's role been uh, in uh, any of this? Jeff or Peyton to uh, either of you. I mean, I, I, I frankly don't know. I mean, those of us who have been to Addis have seen all the cranes. We know, we know how deeply China is, in, is engaged in terms of investment. I mean, I mean in, I'll just make a general comment, Vanda. Um, China you know, seeks markets. China seeks resources. Um, and th this tends to be easier in, in times of stability. Um, and so I can't imagine that China would, would want to see the, um, a type of collapse of Ethiopia that picking up on what Peyton said would make Syria look like child's play um, because that would not be in China's interest in trying to access markets and in ac and in access resources. If I can just respond and engage a little bit, but of course China at the same time um, holds the position that what happens internally is the business of uh, Governments, uh, we should not be, uh, be the international community, should not be messing in internal affairs. And China itself does not shy from using a melt fist approach to a much um, uh, lesser mobilization internally, such as in Xinjiang, than what we are seeing in Tigray. You know, this, this business of we d you do what you want, uh, and at the same time, we want uh, stability. Um, is often grossly attention, and it seems to be critically attention in what's uh, happening in Ethiopia. What kind of uh, dilemmas or opportunities does this pose for China? I think that probably in the Security Council context, this is a real dilemma for China because you're right. Chi China does not. Um, China China very much opposes you know external interference in the internal matters of of, of member states, and China, in fact. Um, is always looking, looking for ways in the UN context to change terminology, terminology that we, that we would interpret as, as defining um, internal governance, say rule of law. When we say rule of law, we're talking about how do governments treat their citizens. China in a UN document will always insert between states after the term rule of law. So China tries to change the debate from rule of law, meaning internal rule of law, to how states treat each other I mean, the UN context. Um, so yes, China's instincts would be, do not question uh, Prime Minister Abe's description of this as being, as being police action, internal security. The problem though, is China aligns its positions in the Security Council with the A3, with the three elected members um, from the African continent who, are, who, who go into the UN for two year, into the Security Council for two year rotational tours. So it looks as though we have a situation where the A3 with South Africa on the Security Council until the end of the year. South Africa, unfortunately, rotates off the Security Council at the end of the year. But we have the, the A3, um, Africa, um, Niger, Tunisia, um, as of last night, of course, they, they withdrew it, wanting to have a Security Council briefing on, 
on the internal, the internal situation in Ethiopia. This would be against all Chinese instincts, but China wants to ally itself with the A3 always because China relies on that relationship with the A3 to build up its own political capital in the, in the UN and others. So I think that there is a, a bit of a political dilemma for China in how they would look at this. Um, should, should, the, should it come down to the fact where they would have to choose between the A3 and, and Prime Minister Abe? Um, thanks very much, Evan. Of course, China's role also goes back to the Tigray period where a tremendous amount of land dispossession uh, in Ethiopia, including in, the, uh, in Oromia, took place for the purpose of leasing land to actors like UAE, like Saudi Arabia, and like China for food production, uh, often leases that were 30, 40 years long, even longer, and at the time were generating um, social strife, um, violence, violent repressions, and were some of the underlying factors that brought uh, the demise, ultimately, of the uh, TPLF regime. Uh, Peyton, uh, to you with any further thoughts on the region, Sudan, Egypt, but also if you can start pivoting to uh, another set of questions that we are getting, namely, what uh, uh, should be, uh, what are some of the rule of law, as uh, Jeff just phrased it, and not the way the Ethiopian government uh, means it, actions in terms of um, the, the purges of all Tigray uh, personnel from uh, working at the airport uh, in Addis, to the uh, blanket censorship on any kind of media communication to huma uh, integrate the humanitarian aspect. What kind of uh, uh, internal accountability mechanisms on the government, not for past crimes, but what's behaving uh, correct, what's behaving currently, what's happening currently, um, uh, should be uh, taking uh, place? So the, the, the perspective of human security uh, if we can bring that in. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, look, I think, as I think others have said, it's, it is, there, there is an absence of uh, firm facts, right? But, and, and certainly the, the government has denied to some extent that there's any targeting of, of uh, Tigrayans, uh, either government officials or, or private sector uh, actors. But I think what that argues for, uh, as Ambassador Feldman said, is, um, Clearly, there is a, tr a trust deficit plaguing the country, right? So to the extent that, uh, and I would hope that it would, the prime minister and, and those around him, uh, as the leader of the country, would find it in his interest to address that deficit of trust across the board. Uh, I think they need to seek international capacities for doing that along the lines of what, uh, what Jeff suggested, right? If there's any number of tools, uh, whether it's through the UN, through the African Union, um, uh, through other states, where credible independent investigations can start um, alleviating uh, the, the, the set of questions or the sort of ambiguity about what's happening, whether it's respect to ethnic targeting, whether it's respect to security incidents, um, et cetera, and serve as a foundation for verifiable fact as a step towards uh, a restoration of trust uh, and credibility. And, and that is going to be required for any uh, for the restoration of the rule of law, but more importantly, for uh, for a plurality of Ethiopian citizens to believe that there is um, there is a basis for the rule of law, because that's very much, of course, contested. And the way that the um, the uh, military confrontation has unfolded, and the extent to which both sides, whether it's the federal government or the Tigrayan government, have made constitutionally based and legally based arguments uh, that uh, it has essentially politicized the law, right? So we need to look at these kinds of types of mechanisms as I think as Jeff laid out, and there are of course others uh, for how one can do that. I think that speaks to a broader point and, and frankly links to China uh, as well, which is that what I haven't seen, and, I, and I'll, stand corrected. Uh, I have not seen a Chinese endorsement of the law enforcement, quote unquote, operation, right? And in fact, what you haven't seen is any state in the international community uh, endorsing the government's position on that. Now, I'm not saying uh, that folks have condemned it either, right? But if I weren't sitting in Addis, uh, and looking around, I would see actually uh, the fact that none of the neighbors, uh, certainly in the United States uh, now, I mean, very clearly, um, the tweet from the National Security Council last night, European governments, multilateral institutions, uh, 
even the Chinese, no one has actually endorsed the government's position on this question with the possible exception of Eritrea. And I think that's very important uh, to bear in mind, certainly for, uh, for the prime minister and, and policymakers uh, uh, around him. And then if I may, just quickly on Sudan, because I do think it's important. Uh, here is another uh, 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 country that is enduring uh, a severe economic crisis. Uh, and the notion that we will see uh, the kind of the continuation of the refugee flows that we're already seeing out of Ethiopia uh, and Sudan's ability to withstand that on top of its own uh, humanitarian challenges. And as I said, I mean, a situation where you've seen, uh, among other things, the value of the Sudanese pound plummet in the last um, 12 months. I think should be deeply concerning. So when we think about a humanitarian response, what we're actually thinking about, and I mean, this goes to the point of internationalization or not, uh, what we're actually thinking about is really not just a response to the crisis in Ethiopia. I think we need to be contemplating what the broader humanitarian um, ripple effects will be in Sudan, in Somalia, uh, as you of course know well, Vanda, because this isn't just gonna stop uh, at you know putting some Ethiopians in a couple of camps in Eastern Sudan and being able to give them food and then you know sort of ring fence it. Uh, instead, it's gonna have these really tremendous uh, aftershocks, I think again, at risk of sounding alarmist, as we obviously saw um, in, uh, in the context of Syria, right? I mean, the aftershocks, whether it's for Lebanon, as, as Jeff knows well, of course, uh, Jordan, Turkey, elsewhere. And I think it's that scale and that uh, enormity of the challenge that really needs to, to bring focus uh, and, and an uptick uh, of attention uh, to what we're facing here. And let me add uh, to the uh, dire envisionable scenarios, also uh, already some existing reality, even if there were uh, not the current military confrontation, the region has been uh, close to famine or really difficult uh, security, uh, difficult um, economic and humanitarian situation because of locusts because of droughts or conversely very intense rains. It's really been dramatically precarious uh, and dire in Somalia. And it is perhaps uh, the distraction of COVID globally and also the um, enormous um, impact of COVID globally that uh, we are seeing less reporting as to what even without violence, uh, the um, famine, food security, humanitarian um, uh, dimensions uh, in the region are. Uh, Zach, uh, sorry, um, Peyton, before I go to Zach and Jeff also with the last question, uh, one quick question to you about the Ethiopian election. So the delay of the uh, elections was one of the immediate triggers uh, of uh, the, the current confrontation, the military crisis with Tigray, with uh, President Abi, uh, Prime Minister Abiy deciding to uh, postpone the elections because of COVID and the Tigray leadership rejecting that and uh, holding its own election despite Abiy's wishes in September and being re-elected and being re-elected uh, very robustly, even though um, um, nominally no elections were supposed to uh, take place. You were alerting us to the grave risks of holding premature elections, such as uh, in March, whether it's violence or uh, producing uh, a hung and paralyzed government like in Iraq that, or for that matter Lebanon that could easily go on for months and months and months uh, with uh, really no uh, robust leadership uh, capacity. What, what's your just quick take? Should elections be postponed? How, what should be the process? By what time frame? I think you used the key word, Vanda, when you mentioned, when you were talking about this in the context of Somalia, which is by consensus. And that's uh, not what happened actually with the postponement of elections in Ethiopia. It wasn't done by consensus. There were legal arguments on all sides and I don't, I'm not a lawyer. I won't, uh, I won't break, uh, break those down or analyze them. But I think what we're seeing are the after effects of a decision that was made uh, in the absence of consensus. And so I think certainly no matter what you know, decision is made on, on the next steps for elections, and frankly, this I mean, goes back to the where we keep going, which is the need for a political uh, initiative. It really is about restoring uh, consensual politics in Ethiopia. And I, and I must say, I think here, and I mean, you mentioned this earlier, one of the largest obstacles to that is that I think what we've seen, it, again, long preceding, frankly, this confrontation between the federal government and Tigray, uh, is the prime minister's tendency to equate dissent with criminality. 
Uh, and uh, that is a pretty fundamental barrier to, to forging any sort of consensus uh, and really is just a recipe for sort of endless debate uh, over who's wrong uh, and who's right. And Zach said earlier, you know, there's plenty of blame to go around. There's plenty of responsibility to go around. Uh, but uh, litigating that endlessly, certainly through force, uh, is probably not a um, uh, is probably not going to take the country uh, on a more stable uh, uh, course. Well, thanks. And lighting round uh, at the end, we have about uh, one minute uh, to the uh, close of the session. Uh, U.S. policy and U.S. policy uh, both currently for the next uh, month and a half and in the Biden administration. How tough should the U.S. Uh, get? Uh, freeze aid, uh, deliver economic aid, deliver only humanitarian aid. Uh, what, uh, you know, in kind of 30 second responses uh, are some of the key elements. Um, Zach, let me start with you. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, I think, uh, as I mentioned, a slight shift in U.S. policy uh, recently. Uh, the key is that the United States can't be silent. Uh, the, the, the continued military campaign and the continued framing this as a law enforcement operation is only enabled by uh, silence from historically Ethiopia's biggest foreign partner. Um, so I think the United States needs to get more actively involved behind the African Union. And, and I will say, and it's, it's not always easy to say this, I do think despite how difficult this looks right now, uh, I do think there is a way out. Uh, I think because of what Peyton and Jeff have both outlined about the international community, how states have posture to date, what they have or haven't said, uh, there, there is a relative unity, uh, or at least a lack of disunity uh, among external partners, which if we look at, uh, at Syria or other conflicts that we mentioned, that's always been uh, an exacerbating factor. At least right now, we don't have that uh, outside of potentially Eritrea. But if you look at the U.S., uh, the Gulf, uh, the Europeans, possibly even China, as has been mentioned, uh, it does seem to me there's potentially a way out. Uh, I think uh, that depends uh principally on decisions taken in Addis Ababa over the next uh, maybe days. And, and does the prime minister uh, want to uh, restore uh, the kind of narrative uh, that won him the Nobel Prize? Or is he going to create uh, yet another cycle of repression in Ethiopia? Thanks. Uh, Jeff, the <laughs> elevator speech talking points on uh, US policy for the Biden administration on January 20th. I mean, with, with, with the possible exception of Eritrea, as Zach said, there is an emerging international consensus behind what, what has to happen, at least, at least in the broadest terms. The US um, can be the engine um, behind, the Af behind the African Union in uniting what is sort of a general um, approach toward um, ceasefire and mediation to something, to something more specific. I don't think the US should be conditioning humanitarian assistance unless suddenly humanitarian assistance a la Syria is being, is being, is being weaponized. But I do think that the U.S. needs to raise its voice um, to um, turn an amorphous consensus toward mediation into something specific. Peyton. I will just, I know we're over time, so I will just associate myself with, uh, with colleagues and Mark, remarks. I mean, look, there's not a military solution to what is fundamentally a political problem. Uh, and as inconvenient uh, and challenging as it is to engage in politics, it's uh, it's necessary, and uh, and I think uh, Jeff's exactly correct that it's going to take uh, an engine of U.S. policy uh, to drive that forward, not to define solutions, nor frankly should the African Union Initiative to define solutions, uh, but to ensure that Ethiopians are able to come to a consensus uh, on their own on a different way forward. Thank you very much, Peyton, for joining us uh, again. Another um, stellar uh, conversation. Very much thanks to you, like in our September uh, event. I encourage everyone uh, who wants to get even more uh, deeply on the horn on Ethiopia to look up the link that's on, on web. Uh, Zach and Jeff, um, enormous thanks to you for your um, great insights and for being such uh, uh, wonderful and amazing colleagues uh, at, in the initiative on non armed actors and Brookings more broadly. And um, thank you very much for all three of you for joining us today and sharing your insights. And very many thanks to the uh, audience. Uh, we really value it and greatly appreciate that we got over 50 questions and that we had such robust participation, um, including from uh, 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 people who come from the region. We look forward to further conversations and uh, good day um, to all of you. Mm -hmm.
Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.